Lars Ulrich here, and you're listening to It's Electric with my guest, Tom Morello. Why don't we start with Atlas Underground? It sounds great. Recognize a few voices. Recognize yeah. Marcus Mumford. Yeah, there's Big Boy, Killer Mike, Wu-Tang. I mean, it goes on and on. K-Flay. There's, uh, I wanted to make a record that was the Hendrix of now was the idea, which has three components to it in my mind. One, it has to have guitar playing that is outside of the norm and is extraordinary. Two, uh, one of the defining things about Hendrix was he had radio songs. You know, right, yeah, he didn't just look cool and play some exotic guitar. The reason why we know his name is because he had blasted jams that connected on, you know, with a mass audience. And then three is the of now part. Hendrix mail you was blues rock. And now it is a world of hip hop and EDM. So what I wanted to do was, you know, aim to create a new genre of music that combines like my analog Marshall stack guitar playing with like the sounds of now and then some of my favorite singers and rappers. How long have you been working on it? My gosh. Uh, it's uh, come together in the last six to eight months or so, but over the course of the last three years. But every once in a while, you know, I would take 18 months off to go tour with Bruce Springsteen or put a band together like Prophets of Rage and tour the world with that. So uh, it's been a labor of love and I'm glad it's finally coming to fruition. You don't exactly sit still <laughs> no, very not, often, not do well, you? <laughs> not well. Have guitar, will travel. But it, it's been years and years. Yeah, it's been and, years, yeah. And percolating. I've, I've studio at my house, and a lot of it has been, um, you know, email rock in a way where, you know, somebody's, you know, on tour in <laughs> Siberia. And you're, you know, Officially you're, in the dictionary now, <laughs> email rock. <laughs> exactly. You know, and you're sending, you know, tracks to Pussy Riot, who's, you know, in a gulag. And, of course. You know, Siberia, but are you... Right? Producing it yourself? Yeah, it's, it has a number of different producers. I mean, from on the EDM side, it's, you know, Bass Nectar, Pretty Lights, Knife Party, Bauer. Uh, I produce some songs myself. In my day jobs, I tend to be very type A and controlling person. This has allowed me to kind of let go a little bit. And I'm more of a, while I'm a songwriter and producer and guitar player, I'm, I'm a curator more than anything else. And it's kind of creating a new sound with a new vibe that's very, very guitar oriented, but that challenges myself artistically. And that's what, what I'm in it for. Rap has been a significant part of, of your whole sure. musical journey for coming up on 30 years. EDM, where has that figured yeah, in? Yeah, I, I used to, I, I can tell you that no one was a greater enemy of EDM than myself. Like, I, <laughs> okay. I, 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 I referred to it as Italian taxi cab music, you know, and like, you're like, oh, you, no matter where you were in Europe, you're on your way to the gig, you're like, oh, turn that awful thing down. Uh, but it was a few years ago where a friend of mine who has, sort of in the Nine Inch Nails world, has one foot in the rock and one foot in electronica. I said, play me something I might enjoy. And he played me Knife Party and Skrillex. I was like, this is heavy metal. Like it had the same tension and release and the same aggression and the same audacity. And it wasn't Ibiza dance jams. It was like the drops felt like rage drops to me, you know? Uh, and I said, what if we took music that's cut together like this, but we replace their synthesizers with my electric guitars. So I've always liked the idea of sort of challenging myself and sort of incorporating other genres while keeping the integrity and authenticity of who I am. There's a track called Lucky One. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We thought maybe that was K-Flay. That's K-Flay, yeah, 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 yeah. Is the record done? The record is done, and we're waiting for one or two more songs to come in. But by the time people hear this, I got a feeling. Via be... email. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Or whatever. Yeah. There's a lot of musical territory yeah. covered. Yeah. Do they start with a guitar riff? Different songs in different ways. So uh, Battle Sirens that I did with Knife Party. The most important thing was the concept. So I get on the phone and go, here's the kind of record that I want to make. I want to make analog, metal, hard rock and riffs. And you're, you're making these phone calls yourself yeah, 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 to the yeah, artist. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and, and these are the songs yours that I really, really love the vibe of. What if we replace some of your synthesizers with some of these? What do you think? And they're like, a lot of them happen to be fans of Rage and Audio Slaves, so they're happy to take the phone call. And so then I would send them, like, a riff box. So here's 10 Morellian riffs. Here's 15 different weird guitar sounds. And then I said, use this as your treasure trove to build from. So then they would send me back a track of something that I would play on top of that, send that back to them, and then would, the process would kind of build from there. Wow. Yeah. That's really it was pretty great. Uh, it was pretty unusual. Have you ever worked like that no, before? No, no, no. No, I mean, the, the, one of the things that I tried with this record is to work in ways that I had never worked before. Every record I've made is standing toe-to-toe -to -toe in the studio. You know, you, you're looking at the drummer and toe-to-toe, -to -toe, and I'm like, I, I've made... 16 records like that. Let's try something out of the box. For example, there's a, a song with Gary Clark Jr. called Where It's At Ain't What It Is. And he and he came to my studio um, and we just did like blues rock jamming all night long. 
he got on the mic, sang some stuff. Thank you, Gary. He's a tremendous talent singer and charismatic guy and great guitar player. So he goes away, and then we just take those bits and pieces and put them through this kind of industrial grinder. And then when I played him the song, but it's unrecognizable from what went on in the room, but uh, pretty exciting. When the email with this 15 Morellian riffs departs yeah. your yeah, yeah. inbox, is that exciting? Do you send the same 15 riffs to each artist or no, 15 no. different riffs? I kind of I tailor them, tailor them. You know, I have this kind of pretty big pool of stuff uh, logged, and I, you know, sort of pick these 10 for Bass Nectar, these 10 for Pretty Lights, or the, the Pretty Light song, which is called One Nation. I did the same th thing with him, and he was like, nope, you got to come down. So he lives in New Orleans, and uh, so went down there and... Let me tell you, there are, it's people who smoke weed, and then there are people who smoke weed. And I'm in a band with Be Real. And, I was just going to say. Gonna, and I'm saying, right. and this guy smokes oh, some weed. Right. <laughs> wow. So it's just like guys twisting knobs on effects pedals you know, till the dawn, and eventually a product comes out of it that is unlike anything in his catalog or mine. Were there different riffs that would depart to different inboxes based on the artist where they're like these riffs seem like they would be more for yeah. Knife Party and these yeah. guys for RZA. It was maybe kind of Jackson Pollock rock in a way is that I didn't want to like prejudice them. I would send a variety of riffs and then see what they responded to. You know, the Bass Nectar song that has uh, it called Rabbit's Revenge that has Killer Mike uh, and Big Boy on it. We tried for a long time to find the right groove and the right beat and something that was going to be monstrous. And none of the things that I was sending him was working. So he came down to my studio, and I was just warming up. He said, did we just record that? I'm like, I don't know. I asked the engineer. He's like, yeah. So he took the tiniest little warm-up riff, and that became the entire song. And it's those kind of happy accidents in the making of this record. It felt so such a fresh way to work and such an exciting way to have unexpected rocking results. So this really is a true collaborative absolutely, undertaking. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. What was different about the Rage Process, creative process yeah, yeah. and the audio slave and just going th to yeah, each one yeah. of them a little bit. The rage process was really, it was a punk rock ethos more than anything else. And it was a band that was born just out of, I mean, a pure and authentic love of playing that music. I can't emphasize how there was zero commercial ambition. We didn't think we'd be able to book a club show. There was, there were no multiracial neo-Marxist hip-hop punk rock heavy metal bands playing the Hollywood scene during that time. So it was just for us. It was literally just for us. The, the goal was to make a cassette. We're going to make our own record and we're going to have it and we, our friends can listen to it. But with that band, it was so... In the, the intensity of Zach on stage is no different from the intensity of Zach in the rehearsal studio. So we were these kind of these, you know, we're sort of sweaty, shirtless punk rock warriors with no audience, like, and no hope of an audience. And we just wrote those songs and... Was there a battle cry or an MO or an I, you know, when we started and Hetfield and I were playing and we met Mustaine and we met, you know, uh, Kirk Hammett and we'd sit and talk about, you know, Diamond Head and Motorhead and sure, this sure. and that. Yeah. And, and there was a, yeah. what were some of the names yeah. being thrown around Absolutely. in that studio when you guys were first yeah. interacting? It was Zeppelin, Jane's Addiction, Soundgarden, uh, Minor Threat, Cypress Hill, Public Enemy and Ice Cube. Again, very vast. Yeah, yeah, a lot of different stuff. Yeah, yeah. you mm -hmm. ended up collaborating with one of the guys that whose name you threw around for the right, rage, exactly, the rage exactly, creative yeah. process. So we were hanging out with Rick Rubin a lot and listening to music over at his place, and it was actually the Soundgarden song "Slaves and Bulldozers" that we were listening to at full volume at Rick's, and we all looked at him and were like, w "It's painfully obvious that we should just call up Chris Cornell." <laughs> and so Rick and I made the trek up to Ojai to, I guess, this kind of spooky. You know, house on a spooky hill, and I didn't know Chris that well. I met him a couple times, but you know, the doors. Oh, it's like sort of, ca sort of a, a Spanish style castle Dracula. Well, of course it you is. Know? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> hey, let me see. He comes out with no shirt on. He comes out. I mean, with he comes beads, lanky, like, like, like the doors yeah, open on their own, <laughs> with just beads and, and seven necklaces. And I, and I remember we're there looking my, like the rock god we're, that he is. We're there in my van. <laughs> where there, it's like this kind of long staircase that goes up, and there's these motorcycles parked out in front of it, and it's dusk. It's like it's turning dusk, and we're in my van, and Rick and I are parked. In the, in the lot there, and it, the the doors open mysteriously, and Chris's lanky form starts coming down the steps, and Rick turns me and go, "Let's get the fuck out of here." <laughs> <laughs> He's going to you, drink our blood. And no, then but you ended up staying. We ended, ended, ended up staying for six years. Yeah, exactly, ended up staying for six years. So um, Chris was just a, a, a real sweetheart. When you're working with uh, Brad and Tim, which obviously has been 
what close to 90, what, 20, 91 so we started 26, seven, six, seven yeah, years yeah, seven tell years. me a little bit about the dynamic How internally that, yeah. between the three of yeah, you yeah well the first Brad Wilk actually I could uh, almost remember his music connection ad verbatim it was he cited Bonham and James Brown in the thing which got my attention and and you know he's like hard-hitting drummer influences you know John Bonham James Brown I'm like well, let's play with that guy and Brad and I jammed together and really from the first time I the way that his playing locked in with my right hand with my rhythm playing sounded like that from the first time we would rent this play on on hollywood and western there's a big factory of rehearsal studios we couldn't afford one so we uh, there was some metal band was there and we would rent the space in front of the metal band's drum kit just brad and his little kit <laughs> and me and my marshall half stack you know what? crammed up you know in front of this thing playing know your enemy and township rebellion and freedom and the songs that would become those jams and it sounded Exactly like it, you know, later did in concert and on the record. Then Brad actually went away for a while to join the beginning version of Pearl Jam. He and Eddie Vedder had been friends, and Pearl Jam made the 10 record, parted ways with that drummer, and called Brad to ask him to join. I think they were called Mookie Blaylock at the time. Sure. Yeah. He asked him to, wow. jo to join Pearl Jam. So Brad never knew that. Broke up with me to go to rehearse with Pearl Jam in England. Brad and Eddie were in a band called Indian Style in the San Diego area, and then Eddie, like Brad as a drummer, invited him to to practice those songs from 10 while he was Brad was away two timing me um, <laughs> uh, another drummer introduced me to Tim and Zach right. so when Brad finally came back eventually the four of us got in a room and it I mean, it sounded like rage against the machine from the really from the get-go when you write these insane riffs that you come up with and, and that are so unique when you sit there and it, it takes shape do you feel that's got a kind of an audio slave type of thing. Mm. Was there a point mm. when you were doing audio slave where maybe I'm going to save that riff in case there's a rage oh, record one yeah, day, yeah, yeah. you know, you sort of designate that's got more of this kind of feel mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. it. It was never really a matter of saving stuff, but sometimes a riff or an idea has to find its home and it takes particular circumstances for it to find its home. For example, the very f the first music that starts the first Rage Against the Machine record, which is that little you know, ant farm bit at the beginning of Bomb Track. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Yep. I wrote that when I was 19 years old, a freshman in college. And it just stepped, stayed on a cassette recorder. And I just thought, someday this is going to find a home. And it took, you know, quite a while for it to find a home, and it finally did. There's also, you know, in the, in the tumultuous songwriting process, sometimes there'd be a riff that, because the band not be getting along great that day, that it doesn't find a home on that particular day. And I'm like, I'm going to hold on to that till another day, but right. it might find, a, they, might, yeah, might find a home. They don't know what they're missing out on. There was a huge <laughs> rage a riff that I wrote for Rage, uh, which did not did not take root, that became Show Me How to Live, uh, the, audio, the Audio Slave song. So I just like, I know that's a good riff, but we just got to find a day when it, really finds a home. When you guys, who were obviously the first band within the harder rock world that mm -hmm. really were very open about your political yep. thoughts and your statements, and, and you were very active yep. internally in the band, now we're going to go do the Tibet thing, sure. and now we're going to do the PMRC sure. thing, or, you know, was that effortless? Was it, this is, you know, these are all things we e evenly agree on, and off we just go to the races, yeah. or were each one of them there's one guy who's descending, or how, how did you, those the, things rage, come about? The, the four members of Rage Against the Machine disagreed about a great many things, but politics were not one of them, you know? And often there you know, might be something that Zach is leading the charge on, or I'm particularly passionate about, or something that has like a real kind of punk rock, you know, nonconformist element that Timmy leads the charge on. But, but we really, as a foursome, that was never an issue. It was like, you know, our first single was you i won't do what you tell me 16 times in a row followed by a mother like that was the gauntlet had been thrown yeah, down exactly exactly <laughs> we, could, we couldn't outflank ourselves in that regard so when it came time to doing activist work that was where we really aligned what was it that pulled you guys apart it was from just each other? it was uh i think a lack of you know and i'll put myself you know first and foremost kind of a lack of emotional maturity in being able to deal with each other as people you know, like we had political vision. We had, a, we played, like the shows never suffered, but we just couldn't 
agree on stuff and then that just sort of unearth feelings that made it hard to make records. I think there were competing visions for what it should be and competing sort of feelings about what it was like to be in the band that we didn't deal with. My v version of the band was let's make a record every six months. You know, let's be the political Led Zeppelin and let's change Let's overthrow the government and make the best records that anyone ever did. You know, like, <laughs> by Wednesday, go, go. Like, by Wednesday morning. Exactly, by Wednesday morning. If this isn't done by noon, I'm, I'm pissed off. You know, and in, and in that pursuit, I was not always sensitive to the emotional needs of my band members. And, you know, everybody has sort of their role in it. But that's where I, you know, sort of contributed to the chaos that eventually uh, ended the band. But I will say this, that it's my glass half full version is for a band that had extremely combustible elements to be able to have made four records, to be able to have played the shows that we did, I think it's a miracle. That combustible energy is part of, I mean, you can hear it yeah, yeah. in the f***ing music, first of all. The second observation is that these four records are, they're as timeless as almost any rock records. I mean, they sound as vital yeah. and as necessary 25 years later as they, they did. They sound like they, they're written for now. You know yeah, what I mean? They were written like during the Bill Clinton era. You know what I mean? You know, and there's the, the brilliant lyricism of Zach and, you know, and as, and you know, you've seen the band, like there's, there's no front man in the history of rock and roll. He's like the, you know, he's like the punk rock James Brown. Like it's, the, there's nothing like the electricity of that guy. And then the way that Tim and Brad and I play together is very unique. And that's a, it's, it's chemistry is the whole thing. So, um, I'm just feel fortunate that that band occurred. May I ask, when you guys got back together in, in 07 and I was there yeah. at the first show at Coachella and saw you in San Francisco yeah. on the pier, and yeah. how close did you get to making a record? Zero. Zero? Zero. Okay. Zero. When we got together we in 2007, we had a great time. We had fun on stage, off stage, playing ping pong, going out. It was really, there felt to me like there was a lot of camaraderie. But w one of the ways that we helped that, we kind of took, we took off the table everything that had been controversial before. Writing music, doing interviews, having a manager, like all that stuff. We're just like, we're just not going to do that stuff. We're going to play shows and have a nice time and be able to look each other in the eye and have a nice time and not be, you know, any of the stuff that was, uh, that caused, stirred controversy in the past. We're talking about sort of band history. Let me give you a little bit of my Metallica history. I love Metallica stories. Yeah. So, well, so the first time I, the, the name came across into my world was, uh, I was at Harvard University. I was a, uh, junior. And somebody came in with a, the Kill 'Em All record, and he just showed it to me. He's like, "This is the sh," and I, and he put it on a little bit, and you know, my ears were more attuned to, you know, on the one side it was like punk rock, the other side it was like the Motley Crue stuff, and I just I wasn't hearing it. I just wasn't hearing it. Was this right when it came out, like eighty three, eighty four? Yeah, it was eighty three. It would have been eighty three. Yeah. Um, then we, there was a, a club in Boston called Celebration. Wednesday night was Metal Night Celebration. So we had no MTV. There's no nothing. So every Wednesday, we would don a bunch of Harvard dudes, put our spandex on, put our leather <laughs> bezippered shirts on, tie our bandanas around our thighs, get on the T and go down to Kenmore Square and just went at doors open and sit there and watch metal videos because that's the only time you got to see them. And but it wasn't a video, but between bands or between videos, they played Master of Puppets on that particular day. And I remember there's been I've had three musical experiences like this where I remember I was laughing. I'm like, this is it's crazy people music. It felt like so outside of what music was to me prior to hearing it. The other two times were System of a Down and Jane's Addiction. The first time I heard them, it That's felt like company, three bands yeah, I love, right. three bands I love. But but they, it was an acquired taste. But when it the hammer came down, and I appreciated the the rock that is Metallica, was the Monsters of Rock tour at the Coliseum in '87 uh, with Van Halen. Yeah, with Van Halen. Yeah, '88. That was the biggest ass kicking that any band <laughs> has ever delivered. So I the opening band was Kingdom Come. That was That's Kingdom right. Come. And yeah. I got there. I'm in the park. I'm there when doors open because I, I I went by myself. I bought one ticket. I went by myself. And um Kingdom Come comes on. They've got that song Get It On. It's great. Then Metallica comes in. You're on second. Yep. And it's awesome. I'm like, oh there's that Master Puppet song I thought was crazy. It's it's growing on me. And they are rocking. Like rocking super hard. There's a riot that ensues in the LA Coliseum is ninety thousand people and they're all the chairs are torn up. The fences come down. Every single chair that was on that lawn yeah. ended up on stage. That's right, like 40,000 yeah. chairs. Like, and I, I remember know. we were sitting there going, who the f*** put 40,000 chairs on the yeah. lawn, on the floor? Like, seriously? Yeah, yeah, that was Dude. not that was not good. The production uh, manager should probably uh, have uh, been taking the then, task. And then okay, came Doc. Exactly, exactly. So <laughs> it is one of the, the greatest rocking, you know, it's, 
the, the whole stadium just discovered Metallica, and it's killing us. And then next up comes Dokken, and my man has on a bejeweled cape, right? And they're playing, <laughs> and I was a Dokken fan, you know. But and well, the, all everybody was like, I was a, that was the biggest ass. And then I think it was Scorpions, Scorpions and, and, Van and, and Van Halen. But by that point, the night was over. The night was over. Anyway, that was when I became a Metallica fan. Speaking of beatdowns at the Coliseum, though, I'll have to say a 2011 the show. The L.A. Rising show, yeah. When you guys played there with Muse. Yeah. And I flew down just to see the show. And the fucking ass-kicking that stadium took. That was the last Rage Against the Machine show. Really? Yeah. Wow. Well, That was the last Rage, yeah. That was the highest fucking musical note one can have then. Well, yeah. Well, because if, I, if, if that's the last one, I feel pretty good that you know we went out on a high one. Someone walked me into the uh, photographer's pit. Yeah. And so I was sitting there. You're like eight feet away from yeah. me, right up there. And I would. You guys are playing a "Killing in the Name" as the last song. And I looked back, and there's seventy five thousand people going back, crazy, yelling back. You. Yeah, yeah. It was like <laughs> this is the definition of when an audience and a yeah. band connect yep, yep, in a live yep, setting. Yep. And it, it, it's still when I think of that moment, it's, it's fucking goosebumps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I felt Crazy. that. I felt those goosebumps, too. You know, that was so uh, the L.A. Coliseum. Yeah. <laughs> where we've enjoyed we success. We've had successes. <laughs> right. We've had successes. Yeah. Like I told you when I was driving uh, down here a couple hours ago, uh, looking out the window and thinking about all things Tom Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Sure. You, you inducted are, Deep Purple. I inducted that, yeah. Kiss and the Clash. Are you on the committee? I am. I'm on the nominating committee. So I'm the one. Whenever you whenever you see metal bands appear on the ballot, you can blame me. The, the reason I know that is because uh, Cliff Bernstein's also on sure, the committee, sure, and sure, he sure. gave me the story about you came in, and you. He said it was one of the most impassionate speeches he's ever seen in his career. Was you when you came in in front of the committee and looked every member of the committee in the eye and told them why Kiss should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, yeah. and then they were in the Rock yeah. and Roll Hall of Fame. <laughs> Just tell me how you ended up on the sure, sure, on the, sure on the sure. committee, and I also what's a, that like? I was like a longtime enemy of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, as a lot of hard rock and metal fans are, because it's just it felt like it was. It was not rep it, like our genre was totally dicked over and no one knew it or cared about it or understood it. I spent a lot of time on tour with Bruce Springsteen, the E Street Band, and John Landau, who's Bruce's Bruce manager, Bruce, is yeah. one of the big guys in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So, you know, I would unapologetically tell him in every hotel bar that, like, your Hall of Fame sucks until you put these bands in. <laughs> like, when you're a baseball player, when you're a kid and you're a baseball player, your dream is to have such a career that it's an on that you are honored by being in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Like, that's the dream. So when you're a uh, rock and roll guitar player, drummer, whatever, you could give a sh about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame because it doesn't, it's your heroes aren't there. And, you know, that's an obvious list of, at the time of the 10, at the time was like Rush, Kiss, Deep Purple, you know, this one, that one. Um, and to his, to his credit, he heard my words, you know, and I made that passionate speech in hotel bars around the world. Uh, and, he, and so he got an email and they said, You're on the committee. I'm like, All right, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell him what I think, and he was like, "That's why we want." So I went in there and I just let them have it. And uh, to their credit, they put Kiss on the ballot, and once they were on the ballot, they easily got in. Bruce Springsteen. Sure. You end up. I know that guy. Playing yeah. guitar, traveling all <laughs> over the world, hanging out with not just this great band, but obviously also you know primarily with him. What's that like? Yeah, it's crazy, dude. I am not a casual Bruce Springsteen fan. Like I'm one of those guys that. You know, I subscribe to multiple fanzines about Bruce Springsteen. And, you know, <laughs> I once saw him at Tower Video on Sunset, and my friend had to literally restrain me from kissing his head, you know. So I was a super big fan. But then we, we became, we became his, his sister Pam Springsteen is, uh, was a rock photographer, so I knew her. And then Bruce and I became acquainted. We were friends for eight years before we ever played together. May I ask how that friendship started? You know, with, through Pam, who was my closer friend, would go be at shows and see Bruce. And, and he was familiar with ra the politics of rage. And we covered uh, his song, The Ghost Tom, of Tom Joad. Yeah, yeah. We did like a, you know, Sabbath up version of his acoustic song. And he had to approve that. And the next time I saw him, that's where I was a little more on his radar. He thought that was very interesting that we had chosen that song to cover and thought, like, w w why is that? And who are you? And what's happening? And we, you know, we struck up a really good friendship and would see him around. And and he, it wasn't until 2008 when we first played together. And I ran, he was in, making a record with Brendan O'Brien. And I ran him at Henson Studios. And he said, you, Tommy, you should play with us sometime. And I'm like, 
I've been waiting my whole <laughs> life to do that. And did he make the call himself? Yeah. So, well, well I, I looked at their itinerary and called him up and said, you're in Anaheim. You know, it was a month later. We're like, you're in Anaheim, you know, two days from now. Can I come play How with you? How about then? <laughs> he's like, yeah. <laughs> Let's do Tom Jode. And, and I said, do you want, you know, do you want to do acoustic or electric? He said, be prepared for both. And I said, do you want me to sing? He's like, he was, he, Bruce has come to a bunch of Night Watchman shows. So he's a, you know, so he's like, yeah, of course I want you to sing. And I'm like. I can like got on the phone going. Like, I've never been more nerve. Like the first time I ever called a girl in junior high and playing with Bruce Springsteen, those are two like the most nervous moments of my entire life. And so I, pra- you know, I pr- I practiced all night and I've got the chords and I'm ready to sing it. And I read- so he says, get there at four thirty. I'll band. I'll do it for a half hour. Work on it. Come on stage at five. I'm like, great. So I get at four thirty and I'm listening to them practicing the song, and to my horror. He has changed the key of the song and raised it like eight steps. Now, I got a low, rich voice here that I had been practicing. Sing, and I'm like, pra- I'm down there now trying to relearn the chords in this new position and sing in this. And I'm, I'm alone. Like, my wife's flying in. For, so I'm completely alone in catering at the Anaheim Pond, <laughs> freaking out. And so it's my try. I'm going on stage. I can't not do it. And I don't know how to play it now. And I can't sing it now. And I'm just like. I'm standing on stage with the E Street Band, and like, oh, Bruce, is, we're counting it in. Like, I, I'm trying to like transpose the thing here, and I just can't do it. And it's clear that it, I'm not well. Little Steven, who's in, in the band, then is like, hey, it's, just, it's, it's here's the thing, and here's the, thing. and I am, it's going very, very poorly. Now, this is why they call Bruce Springsteen the boss, and it's for good reason. Bruce Springsteen sees what's going on. He comes over, puts his hand on my shoulder, looks me in, and says, "We're going to do it in this key." It's gonna be great, and then that's it. And that's it. There was no other. I, there was no other was possible like, way out. Like, that was that was like a Jedi. <laughs> it was like a full Jedi move. Because then I thought, you know what? I'm. And if you if you if you check that video on YouTube, you will notice a couple things. I'm not playing any chords in the song. I figure there's 17 people in this band. They're gonna play the chords. <laughs> I know the words to the song. I'm gonna. I can sing about justice and fight the power. I can do that. And then when the guitar solo comes, I and th- during that whole sound check rehearsal, I didn't give anything away in the guitar solo. I didn't give anything away. I vanilla it up. It was all Chuck Berry licks doing the whole thing. So that night, again, I'm completely alone. I got my own the E Street Band's out here. I got my own little dressing room and a bottle of Jameson. And the song's midway through the set, and I'm midway <laughs> through the bottle. And <laughs> and now the moment has arrived, and he calls me up and go out there and played it. And it was one of the most electric and cathartic moments th- that I've ever been in a room for. Like something happened that none of us expected, the fans, him, me, nobody, and then we began playing together for... He really know, is the boss. Yeah, we began playing he together He said it's going to be great, he and said, it was and great. It was pretty great, man. And how many shows did you guys end so up that playing? Was, so that was, for them? years we sort of did a, a, a song or two here. We played at that Rock and Roll Hall of Fame 25th anniversary thing. And then when Steve went away to do Lilyhammer, I did an Australian tour with them. And it was maybe 2013. But while we were down there, it was so fun. And so Bruce, we recorded a record while we were on tour in Australia. He was just inspired. And we'd can day off. You get the call. Like, we're going. I'm like, all right, man. And so we made a record. And then we're we just. We're not going to sit by the pool today. No, we're no, no. go make a record. So we just continued around. I got to tell you, it, you know, I am not predisposed to being in someone else's band. That's not how I'm built. Like, I like to be. You know, have my hand on the wheel, and but the only band I would be in, the only person I would trust, <laughs> is Bruce Springsteen. So it was a real honor and a pleasure to sort of see him work every day, and his commitment to greatness and his passion for being there. Like there are rabid Bruce Springsteen fans, but no one is more excited to be in the room than Bruce Springsteen at any of those shows. As somebody who's as prolific as you are, and and if the last couple hours have not proven that, I mean. Football games and kids aside on the weekends. Yeah, all, what do you do? Nothing to, else. What do you do to disconnect from all of it? I am. I am. My principal thing that I do in life is I'm a you know a father and a husband. That's it. I mean, I coach little league this this weekend. I have you know two flag football games and a little league game and a kid's birthday party. So it's like I'm all in on that, and it, it allows me to then you know be totally present in those moments. And then when I rock, I'm it it's it's a you know, I, I get to always return to that island of sanity or insanity, which is, you know, raising <laughs> raising young kids. But it feels like a, a grounding and a connection. And it's all and I've always felt kind of a Midwestern humility, but it makes me just feel part of like I feel a connection to life in a way through my family in a way that 
you aim for in music. Perfect. Super metal, right? I know. On that super metal note, (laughs) Tom, thank you for uh, coming in and uh, spilling your guts. Yep. Thanks very much, man. Death to false metal. That's right. (laughs) Grim Reaper.